Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Meeting House Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Paul John Rudoy, and I'm the director of the Chorale here at Meeting House Church. I like to remind us all that if you have a voice, you have a song. And everyone has a voice in the music ministry here at Meeting House Church. And now is the time to join us with your song. So join me and the Chorale, or you can audition for Tim Takash and the Chamber Singers. You can join us for the many We Sing events next year, or participate in our new Meeting House Masterworks series that's starting next season. Or you can volunteer your time and talents, musically or otherwise, in the many services that we have. However you'd like to get involved, go ahead and send me an email at prudoi, that's P-R-U-D-O-I, at meetinghouse.church. Now, before the service begins, let's reorient ourselves with the online worship experience. Check out the description below to find helpful links for you to get the most out of today's service. You'll find PDFs of our handouts, links to learn more about our community, and even ways to submit prayer requests. And of course, you can do all these things and more at our website, meetinghouse.church. Now, as we're getting ready to start this morning, go ahead and send us a message in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. And from all of us here at Meeting House Church, welcome. Good morning. My name is Mark Patrick. I'm the care pastor here at Meeting House. Welcome today, those of you who are in person. There are more of you than I expected. This is wonderful. And to those of you who are worshiping online, welcome to you as well. Please be seated. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, this is Memorial Day Sunday also. And uh, I was asking myself, what, what do you suppose people's memories are of Memorial Day? Turn to the person next to you just for a moment. What's one memory you have of how your family observed or celebrated or acknowledged Memorial Day? You have 15 seconds. Go. <laughs> and you at home also.
Thank you very much. You'll have, you'll have to finish those later. My memory started at Lund's parking lot when I was in grade school. There was a parade that would start there and go all the way down to that historic building right across from Perkins restaurant. Now you all are old enough to remember Perkins. Several years from now you won't be. People will tell you there used to be a pancake house where that high rise is. But uh, we all have our memories. I remember uh, the, the service they had at that historic building included a 21-gun salute. That was very exciting to a young kid that knew nothing about guns and didn't really know why we were celebrating, but there were these guns being shot off, and we would rush to get the spent shells on the ground afterwards. That was just before we stood in line for way too long to get one of the donuts that they had brought to uh, celebrate. And then they had coffee that I wasn't interested in back then. Those are my memories of Memorial Day. Of course, then we'd go to the grave site and people would put flowers there and so on. What I've realized recently is I was watching other people have memories. I was creating my own of these you know, minor celebrations, but I was watching other people find deep meaning in the too long speakers who were talking about things that were kind of over my head as a young grade school kid. But I was watching other people have memories. Now I have my own memories and I can appreciate what they were doing and why. And it's very significant. In Memorial Day, we not only celebrate, if you will, the people who gave their life for us in their service, but I think of it also as celebrating some of the people that came back changed. Remember Uncle Howard. Uncle Howard was an interesting guy. He had a, what we call the short fuse. He would, you know, get, get reactive sometimes. It seemed like the smallest thing. And so there were these outbursts of angers and emotions swung back and forth. What's with Howard? Why does he do that? Uh, sometimes Howard didn't track real well. And he'd get this far off look in his face and we'd say, well, what's, what's with that? Why doesn't he engage with us? Uh, back then they called it shell shock. Now they call it PTSD. My wife, Polly, at, at his memorial service, talked to his children and said, yeah, that's, that was really difficult for Howard with his PTSD. With his what? Well, with his post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, what's that? And she talked to them about it. Oh, you, you, mean, you mean the war and his time in the war had something to do with how he's been since then? Oh, yeah. Well, they didn't know. We're better at communicating that kind of information now. But back then, it wasn't as common. So they missed out on understanding who their father actually was and the impact of his service and whatever he experienced that he either never talked about but always thought about. So Memorial Day is not only a time to celebrate and acknowledge people who gave their life, but people who lived their life with the impacts of war. So keep that in mind as you celebrate, as you're with your family to, uh, today and tomorrow and, and so on. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we do remember you and thank you that you remember us. Give us understanding of one another. Give us an appreciation for all of the things that we have been through. Some of them we've been through together and others we've just been through on our own. So give us that understanding and compassion for each other as we move forward. We pray this in your name. Amen.
Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning to our friends online. I want to invite you now into a time of prayer to allow your heart and mind to be stilled and opened so that we might connect together through the power of the Spirit. Let's pray together. Creator God, we lift up our voices this day first to give thanks, to give you thanks that you are indeed the living God who cares for this world, whose first and last word to this world is yes, is life and life abundantly. Let your spirit blow not only in our own lives, but into every life on this planet, that we might be renewed to live into your vision of peace, of wholeness, and a flourishing life. But oh dear Lord, We must also lift up voices of lament. We are angered and shocked and sickened by the other, by the utter senseless violence in Uvalde, by the hatred in Buffalo, by the many, too many lost lives in cities and towns across this land and around the world. When will it end? When will we turn from the ways of violence? You have shown us the way, O God, but we cannot seem to find it. We know what you ask of us, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. But we so often choose to turn in other directions. Forgive us and remind us that there is in fact another way, the way of life in fellowship. Give us the courage and the strength and the hope to struggle for that different way for that different world. In this regard, O God, bring all those who have been entrusted with authority to their senses. Give to them wisdom, fortitude, and imaginations that are bound not by the grinding gears of partisan politics, but by a vision of your shalom so that something good may be done to stop this violence. And for our brothers and sisters, oh God, those who, whom we know and whom we don't know, whose lives have been torn by violence, especially gun violence, may they know your nearness. May they know your comfort in their grief and trauma. Today we think especially of the children, knowing that they are near to your heart. Be with each child who survived in Uvalde, and with each child who has lost someone to gun violence, whether in Buffalo, in Ukraine, in Russia, in Nigeria, or around the world. Bless them too and for life, O God. May they truly experience your healing love in this time. And may we too be instruments of your care and your peace for everyone that we are privileged to serve, even as we work to make this world a more hospitable place. 
We are indeed thankful, Lord, for the small places and spaces of shalom that we experience in our lives, even as we long for your peace to spread throughout this world. We pray that this community, Meeting House Church, can be such a place. Empower us, O God, to live into your calling for our common life together, to be a place of meeting, a place of fellowship, a place of welcome. We also lift up to you this day the special needs of our congregation. We lift up to you those who are sick, all those who are in need of healing and those who are preparing to go into surgery, including especially Brenda Marshall, David Yates, Jerry Seavers, Eleanor Westerberg, and all those whom we hold in our hearts. Spread out your hand over them in their need and over their families and be present to the physicians and the communities that will surround them in the trials that they face. We pray also for the family of Roy Wayne, for the family of Edie Norquist, and for Jenny Anderson at the death of her sister Kay Cookie Kurtz. We grieve with our brothers and sisters and join them in commending their loved ones into your care and eternal embrace. May they know your peace in this time of grief and may their loved ones rest in your peace and rise in the power of the resurrection. We also join with Linda Berger in giving thanks for all those who have served and those who have given their lives in service in whose honor today's flowers are given. And in all these things, O oh God, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into trial, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. I appreciate that. Good morning to also our brothers and sisters who are joining us online. It's a real pleasure to be able to be here with you today. My name is Christian Nguyen. I'm the teaching minister here at Meeting House Church. And our goal as a community is to be a welcoming people, a people who seek out one another, who try to see one another. And my hope for you this day is that you will experience that welcome, that you will feel that welcome, and that you will extend that welcome to others. Now there's a few uh, announcements that I have been tasked uh, to pass on to you. Let me wipe away my tears here for a second. Uh, the first is, uh, as you know, we're gonna be uh, doing some connecting with one another uh, during the uh, course of the summer. One of those gatherings is uh, called Theology on Tap. Now, before you get worried, it's only an hour and a half, and it's a two-drink minimum. Or no, no, two-drink limit. I'm sorry, two-drink limit. Yeah. Seriously, though, this is, uh, we're going to have this uh, event on June 9th from 6 to 7.30. It's going to be held at Steel Toe Brewery. And the, the vision here really is a space of curiosity. We come together in a place where people gather typically, and we have conversations with one another about things that matter. So if you have the time and you're inclined, uh, drop by, drop in. We're gonna have three of these different gatherings during the course of the summer. We'll update you those uh, as they move forward. Second thing I wanna let you know is uh, on June 12th, we are planning to host an all church brunch that will be specifically dedicated to uh, recognizing our volunteers, our many, many volunteers who give time, who give their talents, 
uh, in service to this community. So uh, you can RSVP, it's open to everyone, but we're gonna spend some time specifically that day uh, recognizing our volunteers. And the ministers get to help host. So we're excited about serving you and being there and just telling you how much we love you and, and care for you and appreciate you. You are the church. We are not the church, you are the church. So in a sense, this is a, a place in the space where we get to recognize that together. Thirdly, next Sunday, uh, we will also be meeting together, but we will not be in the meeting house. We will be in the Great Hall, and we will have a baccalaureate service. Uh, this is a chance to celebrate our seniors and their families, so I do want to encourage you to please be there uh, to cheer on folks as they commence, which means one chapter comes to an end and another brand new chapter begins to open up for them, so make sure that you check that out uh, as well. We look forward to that. Lastly, I dropped my uh, bulletin under the bench, so I don't have it here with me, but there is a QR code on that which highlights a missions survey, and I just want to remind you and encourage you, please, uh, to take the, I think it's seven minutes or so, to fill out that survey, um, and I promise, Jeff, I will also fill it out. I haven't done it yet, so I'll get on that. Uh, so I'd like to invite my friend George up. George Dornbach, come on up, my friend. We're going to be planting some seeds, planting some of our plants that we've been growing through this winter. Um, and for those who are new, we will be in uh, gathering rooms two and three, which are down the hallway. And then there's a nursery hallway as well for our friends in pre-K and the nursery. So when church is done, you can pick up your friends there. All right, so we sing a God's Garden song. The lyrics will go up on the, on the screen, and we're going to sing it right now together. All right? I'm going to change the key really quick, though. There we go. Okay. Come, oh come, come to the garden, gather round, come without fear, known by name here in God's garden, all are welcome here. There we go. Thanks, George. And church, as the kids are heading out, we, we will say to them, have fun, kids. So on the count of three, one, two, three. Have fun, kids. All right. Uh, brothers and sisters, obviously in, in our prayer and, and even in your remarks, uh, Mark, we're reminded that we live in a world of challenge, of trauma, of violence. And we get a moment in the service to just practice something that Jesus wants us to do all the time, and that is to give the peace that God gives to us away. So I want to invite you, brothers and sisters, to stand and pass the peace. Greet your brothers and sisters.
Good morning. Our scripture for today is from the book of Acts, chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers, who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees, stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a prophet, or among them a people for his name. This agrees with the word of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols, from fornication, and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses had had those who proclaimed him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. This is the word of the Lord. Well, what on earth is God up to? There are more blunt ways of saying that that I won't use today. But what on earth is God up to? That's what they are asking back in the New Testament church in the book of Acts. What is God doing? What does it mean? How does it change our expectations for what would actually happen? Now, this is an interesting scripture, Acts 15. And we're going to actually stretch it out a bit to some of the other verses. But uh, you read through it once, and you think, well, they are arguing about something, and uh, someone quoted scripture, and uh, they all seemed to have opinions, and they kept arguing, but uh, then eventually it sort of worked out. There, that's the summary. I'd like to do it in a different way, though. I'd like you to think of it in terms of a baseball game with nine innings, okay? Okay. So, first inning, first pitch. Certain individuals were teaching that one must follow the law of Moses to be a Christ follower. Now, these folks were from Judea. They weren't even from the local congregation. And they were coming and they were beginning to teach these things. 
And the Gentile Christians in particular were troubled. I mean, just imagine uh, a new member joins the local church. Well, thank you. You went through the training. That was wonderful. Uh, you were baptized this morning. That's great. Now we've scheduled your circumcision for Tuesday morning. <laughs> the what? Well, your circumcision. I mean, it's part of the whole deal. You know, that's what they said, those folks from Judea. I didn't sign up for that. Well, of course not. I'm being facetious, certainly. But there were these teachings that even Gentiles who came and learned about Jesus Christ, wanted to follow him, wanted to be part of the community, would have to jump through all these hoops, uh, ritual demands and rules and regulations, uh, not to mention the circumcision and so on. Well, second inning, Paul and Barnabas heard them talking like this and said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What are you talking about? That's not part of the deal. We've been following Christ for a long time. We've seen Gentile people come and become believers in Christ, and they have wonderful sense of the Holy Spirit, and so on. So there was a dispute and debate that took place. I mean, the chapter starts off with Paul and Barnabas arguing with these people from out of town. They're not gonna let it slide. It gets an immediate reaction and it sets up this central question that they were asking back then, what is demanded of someone who wants to follow Christ? Do they become Jews and then follow Christ? Is Christianity, the whole movement, is it underneath the umbrella of Judaism or is it for the world? Paul and Barnabas would say it's for the world and so on. Well, third inning. They realize that they're not gonna solve the problem through arguing that day, and they certainly wouldn't. They need a broader approach. So Paul and Barnabas, along with several other leaders, were selected and sent to Jerusalem to discuss these things. All these issues that needed a decision, that needed a unified approach. Otherwise, you'd have just chaos. One person preaching this, one person preaching that, and so on. So Jerusalem, as you know, was a, a crossroads for that world. Many people from all over the world live there, and many more people pass through there on their way to one place or another. The church there was very influential. And Paul and Barnabas and others were saying, all right, let's check it out with them. That's kind of the... The, the lead church, you know. We've got this franchise of churches all over the ancient world. Well, this is one of the originals. Let's, let's go and see what those leaders say. Let's see if we can't figure this out together. Well, the fourth inning, game moves along. When they arrived, they were welcomed, and they reported what God was doing. And one of the main things they reported was Gentiles all along the way from where we came from to Jerusalem, all along the way, we heard and we saw and we talked with Gentiles who were becoming believers in Christ, following Jesus Christ, warm personal faith, signs of the Holy Spirit in them. Uh, it's wonderful, and they were celebrating that fact. Gentiles were coming to this vibrant faith in Christ in many of the places around there. Now this follows the command, of course, that Jesus made to make disciples of all nations, that's really what they were doing. Uh, John's gospel says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should have eternal life. But the Pharisees said, uh, no, it takes more than that, you gotta keep the rules. Which brings us to the fifth inning. There was still a huge heated debate then at one point, Peter, who never lacked for uh, ego, stood up and said, you know what, listen, listen to me. God chose me to reach out to the Gentiles. You all know that, you've heard my story. You know that I thought one way before and now I think completely another way and that's the way I wanna to talk to you about. I thought they were unclean before, now I realize that whoever God calls clean is clean and acceptable and welcome 
And that's my attitude now toward the Gentiles. The Holy Spirit is working within them. There is no distinction between them and us. Now, that last short sentence was an amazing sea change in in their mindset back then. There is no distinction between them and us when it comes to God. The Jews had always considered themselves, and they were, the, the chosen people, the ones that would bring God's message, bring God's love, bring the possibility of having a connection with God to the world. And the question now is, will we reserve it for ourselves and only give it to those that we think are acceptable, or will we open it up to the world, to people that perhaps before we hardly talked to, we didn't think we had much in common with, and now we realize we are all human, we are all in this together. God's love is for the world, for every ethnic group, every personality type, every uh, expression. God's love is open to them, and he wants them to know Jesus, to follow him, to pray to him, and to connect with him. So Peter reminded them, you know, we are all saved by grace. Well, he had their attention, and then he turns it over to Paul and Barnabas, which brings us to the sixth inning. The people listen to Paul and Barnabas, and it's fascinating Uh, when you read the words, you know, the the word choice is very deliberate. He said, everyone was silent as they listened to what they were saying. You have this group that there was plenty of dissension, all kinds of argument, back and forth, I'm right, no, I'm right, no, you're wrong, no, actually, you're really wrong. All of this kind of chaos of disagreement. And now Paul and Barnabas are speaking, No one's saying a thing. They lean in to what they're saying. And what they're saying, again, is recounting these stories of the amazing things that God is doing with the Gentiles and their amazing response to the message. Now, you couldn't have two more different leaders than Paul and Barnabas. You've done some study. You you know, they're quite different personalities, quite different approaches. The Apostle Paul actually reminds me of my ninth grade wrestling coach. My, you know, I, I went out for wrestling. I hadn't been out for many sports. The only exercise I had as a kid was all the lawns that I mowed in my neighborhood to earn a little spending money, which was fine. But I had never gone, you know, head to head, toe to toe with another person wanting to pin them to the mat and subdue them. That wasn't my personality. I learned later, but uh, there, there was, I, I still can picture, the, I, I can still feel the mat underneath me as we all sat there together, kind of cold because we hadn't even started warming up yet, uh, feeling I don't know what to expect. I've never done wrestling. What's this going to be like? And here's Mr. Cherney, big tall guy, ex-Marine, in shape, ripped, as we say. Pretty intimidating to a little ninth grade chubby kid. So I sat there and as he paced back and forth, he said, you know what, there are 60 of you here today. Three weeks from now, there are gonna be 30 of you. Which group are you in? Well, I I decided right there which group I was in. (laughs) Week and a half later, I was gone. I didn't have anyone in my life at that time to tell me, Mark, don't let him get to you. It's just his way. You know what, just show up, do your best, stick it out. You'll actually improve. You'll come to enjoy it. You'll come to enjoy the, the contest, the fight, the competition. Well, I didn't stick it out there then 
Two years later, though, when it was almost too late, as a junior, I went out for wrestling again. I, I thought, if I just do that, if I show up, stick it out, do my best, I'll be in the best shape of my life. And that's what happened. I stuck it out. I learned a lot. And by the end of my senior year, I thought, man, if I had stuck it out that first time, I could have been pretty good. That's how I think of the Apostle Paul. He's kind of an ex-Marine type. <clears throat> you know, he's the Pharisee of the Pharisees. You go, you'll read Philippians, you have his whole list of credentials, all the things that he's done, all the accomplishments he has, all the degrees, all the study under people like Gamaliel and other f fascinating uh, leaders. And uh, Paul has a very fascinating background, very intense. And sometimes I think he had, probably had less patience for those who didn't have his intensity. Now Barnabas, on the other hand, well, his nickname was the son of encouragement. He was the therapist of his day. Uh, he had a way with people. He had come alongside people at their most vulnerable times. He lent his support to those who weren't finding it elsewhere. Actually, he had even been that person for the Apostle Paul earlier. The Apostle Paul met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. You know the story. And it was several years later that he actually was going to step into ministry. He had been in training. He had been, of course, growing, learning. His life was changing. And now he was ready to give back, as it were, to pass on what he had experienced. The problem was people remembered him. Oh, you're, you're Saul, Paul. Call yourself whatever you like. We know you. We've heard about you. We remember you. And it took Barnabas, who was this encouraging guy, to take Paul under his wings and say, no, I know that you've changed. I know that God has done extraordinary things in your life. Come with me. I'll introduce you to some of my friends. So he took him around, introduced him, and they learned to trust Paul because they trusted Barnabas. And that's the impact that Barnabas had on Paul's life, but also on the early church because it made Paul's ministry possible. Barnabas lent his own credibility to Paul, introduced him to others. So these two are quite a, quite a team. I, I think of it almost like a good cop, bad cop. Here's Paul, very intense. Here's Barnabas, very open and, and uh, willing to talk and listen and, and so on. Two very different personalities with similar values in ministry and in their faith. Still, you know, these very differences that these two men had would lead to a split in their relationship a while later, toward the actual end of this chapter. You can read it. Paul didn't want to take this younger leader, John Mark, on the rest of their missionary journey because John Mark had signed up not for ninth grade wrestling, but had signed up for a mission trip, and he didn't continue. Oh, this is too hard. Oh, this isn't what I signed up for. Oh, I didn't know it would involve this. I'm not ready for this. And he left. The Apostle Paul did not think kindly about a person making that kind of decision. You stick it out. You stay committed. You stay together. Well, Barnabas said, well, let's, let's take him along on this next journey. And Paul said, no. And Barnabas said, well, yes. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Yes, I think we should. No, we shouldn't. And they had such sharp disagreements, Scripture says, that they separated. They went their separate ways. Barnabas took John Mark, Paul took Silas, they both had others with them, and they, they separated ways. So having practiced all this debate and dis dissension and, and so on, maybe wasn't a good thing for them. Ironically, Paul later found a great deal of support and appreciation for who John Mark was and what he had to offer uh, toward the end of his ministry. 
So the people listened carefully to Paul and Barnabas, these strong, helpful, very different leaders. They had a wonderful influence on these early churches. Together they argued for including the Gentiles as full participants in the community of faith. Which brings us to the seventh inning. Uh, Next, James, after listening to all this discussion, and the people were very silent, it's a good time to jump in, Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the leader of the church at Jerusalem, spoke up and pointed to an Old Testament passage that he interpreted as a prophecy saying that people all over the world would come to faith in God, even the Gentiles, that this was God's plan from the beginning. Now, this scripture supported their argument. James said, therefore, I have reached a decision. Now, doesn't he sound like a guy that's been in charge for quite a while? I've listened to all of you talk, thank you, now I've made a decision. And his decision was like, don't, don't trouble the Gentiles. Just tell them to follow a couple essentials. You know, no sexual immorality, don't eat food, sacrifice to idols, a few other uh, dietary restrictions. Uh, and James was very persuasive, as was Paul and Barnabas and Peter and, and others. Brings us to the eighth inning. So everyone agreed that they'd send an official letter to the church in Antioch explaining what their new consensus was. So Paul, Barnabas, Judas, Silas, and others, they delivered the letter to the Gentile church. The people welcomed the letter. They rejoiced. They realized we've now received both acceptance and some guidance. And they appreciated both. They saw it as a positive exhortation of how to live, but also an encouragement that they were acceptable, that they were part of the community of faith, that God had accepted them, but their fellow believers accepted them also. Which brings us to the ninth and final inning. After a while, Judas and Silas traveled elsewhere while Paul and Barnabas stayed to guide the young church with their teaching. When I was in grade school, sometimes we'd have these uh, brief films that they'd show in class. And I know some of the rest of you, not just me, are old enough to remember this, this uh, show that they would have on from time to time. The show was called, You Were There. <laughs> yeah, if you're laughing, you remember it. Uh, they'd have this, almost like a play, where they'd have a scene out of history, and then a uh, a journalist with a microphone and a camera person would would be there and they'd be interviewing these historical figures as they're going through these things. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, I understand that you think such and such. Well, what brought you to that idea? And and Benjamin Franklin would stop what he was doing or who he was talking to and talk into the microphone. And they'd interview people as it was happening. Now, I've often had the fantasy, that's what I would like to be able to do with some of these scenes out of the scripture. You know, as, uh, as they're coming to a, an agreement and Paul and Barnabas are staying to guide these young believers, what did they actually say? They were there for weeks and weeks. They were teaching them. I'm wondering, what did they teach? And the only thing I can come up with, they were teaching the very things that they wrote their letters about in the New Testament. So it was almost like a Bible study before there was a Bible. These are the things that are important to us. These are the things that we'll write about 10 and 20 years later, but this is the gist of it now. As they were developing their ideas, they were expressing them, they were helping people come to understand their perspective on faith. This whole chapter is a a turning point in Christian ministry. The fact that it was open to everyone in the world, it was fulfilling Jesus' command, but also the prophecies, and they were doing it in real time. Now, note the process for deciding, for determining the guidelines for this new movement. The church decided together. They really preferred unanimous choices. A couple of times in this chapter, uh, and everyone was agreement, and uh, you, they unanimously, unanimously decided and so on. They desired consensus over a simple majority vote. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? 
a book written a while back called The Influencers. And the major point of the book is as soon as someone realizes that I'm trying to change their mind about something, they put up resistance and they refuse. I do the same. Someone calls and says, hi, is this Mark Patrick? Uh, Who is this? Well, I'm representing this and that. Uh, Thank you, no, and I hang up. I, I resist someone trying to sell me something that I haven't asked, and I resist someone trying to change my mind unless I voluntarily get into this discussion in the first place. Various leaders weighed in with their perspectives. They lent their credibility to the issues. You know, Peter says, look, I was with Jesus all three years. I've made a ton of mistakes. I know that, and I've learned from many of them. So I have credibility. Listen to me. Uh, Paul says, no, look, I was so zealous. I was so much a Pharisee. I was persecuting the church. Now I've completely changed around. The Holy Spirit has transformed is transforming my life. I, who am the chief of sinners, am now wanting to tell you about God's grace. James said, well, I'm I'm Jesus' brother. I grew up with him. I know him in a way others don't, and so on and so on. But they all lent their credibility to these things. Notice also that the place that deep, sustained, open debate has in this whole process. Now, you know, our church has experienced a bit of that over the last couple of years. Actually, the last several decades. Uh, there's always been one issue or another that you know, we don't agree about yet. And so we talk about it, we listen about it, we challenge one another, and uh, hopefully we come to some consensus. Now, that's not always the case. Uh, in verse two, there was no small dissension and debate. In other words, there's a whole lot of dissension and debate. Verse 7, there was much debate. People felt strongly about their opinions, about their perspective. I often tell people that we don't think we're right. We know we're right. It's not just a passing thought. No, here's how I see it. I think it, therefore it must be. Well, of course, that's not true, but that's how we often approach things. There's nothing new here. Conflicts are common. Conflict is always uncomfortable. We know that from our own experience. Transitions are often a very challenging time. They're tough. This was a major transition with a huge impact on the church of that time. Anytime there's a transition from one period to another, from one way of seeing things to another, there's always some grief along with the chains. You know, we leave some things behind. Things are not as they were. They're not as we expected them to be. We go through all those stages and phases of uh, grief, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and then eventually, hopefully, come to some acceptance where we can move forward. And part of the transition, we reach for some new things a fresh start, new opportunities that weren't possible before. We find ourselves in that position as a church today. So to create the desired community, we have to learn to move from our critical and sometimes judgmental attitudes. We have to learn to become curious about one another, wondering, well, what actually leads someone else to view things so differently than I do? And what's led me to see things the way that I do? And we need to learn to become compassionate where we care about one another way before we change our minds, way before we agree with one another. Our caring isn't dependent on agreement. And we have to learn to become, I'll say compromising, and I mean that in the best sense of the word, willing to work together, willing to learn to see things not as all or nothing, but accomplishing something together. And finally, to experiencing a caring community. Sometimes we talk about the church is like a family. And we always mean that in the 1950s version. Everyone gets along, no one argues, 
uh, and so on. Well, it's, it's more like family currently. Many times we argue. Many times we don't get along. Many times we wonder, well, why did he or she do that? Why don't they see things the way I do? And uh, in, in my counseling practice, in my church life, in my neighborhood, I see families that are torn apart by polarized perspectives, disagreements about things that to each of them seem so simple, but they aren't that simple to the other. So we have the challenges that, and pain that sometimes come along with us as part of being family. That's, as they say, just the way it is. That is either uh, something that will dishearten us or provide an opportunity to grow up, to grow deeper, to be more expressive in our concern and care for one another. Both in the New Testament and to today, the bottom line is this. We are welcomed. We are accepted. We are saved by God's grace. There is no distinction. Our faith is in Jesus Christ. We act and live out of gratitude to God, not out of fear, not out of performance. This vision of a loving community is our desire, it's our goal, it's what we work and pray for. We're not there yet, but we are on the way. Amen.
Thank you so much. That was such a beautiful offering um, and a, a great way to usher us into our moment of generosity. We talk here at Meeting House Church <clears throat> about uh, generosity as a posture, a way of being in the world. Um, and it has to do with our time, our treasure, and our talent. We, uh, uh, as an example, actually, of this, uh, the Creation Care Group got together last week, and they spent some time in the raised beds out front uh, planting. I have a list here. I'm going to read these so, so I don't uh, butcher the language here. But uh, they planted pe- uh, pole beans, bush beans, kooka melons. I'm not sure what those are, but it sounds good. Radishes, carrots, beets, turnips, marigolds, and more. And then uh, across, I think over on the hill, they planted also some sunflowers in honor of our uh, uh, memorial solidarity with the people of Ukraine as they continue to struggle uh, during this time. As you think about how you want to participate, how you want to express your generosity, please remember what I've said every time I've gotten up here, that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. That means a free person, someone who freely chooses to give. So not out of coercion, but out of what you want to give from your heart. If you want to continue to support the ministry of our church, there are definitely uh, many different ways to do that. You can text. uh, You can uh, go online uh, to meetinghouse uh, church backslash, uh, backslash dot get, or backslash give. Uh, and then there's also a, uh, an offering box out front if you want to use the traditional method. So with that, uh, I'd like to invite you as you're able to please rise as we prepare to sing our last hymn. He is King of Kings, number 273. Psalm as a benediction is from Psalm 133. Years ago when we were traveling in Africa with all the divisions and challenges there, this, this, uh, this first verse was written on the wall of one of the retreat centers where we stayed. And here's the whole psalm. How good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in unity. It's like the precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. 
It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. Go in that peace today. One, one other thing. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, pe- people today uh, are almost hesitant to say, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Because people are more reactive and angry about that. I don't want your thoughts and prayers. I want your action and, and so on. Well, we're going to have a chance after our service today to think about and pray about together some of the things that are happening in our world. We do that without apology. We want to be thinking about these things. We want to be praying about them. So go grab a cup of coffee, and if you'd like to participate in that prayer time, the staff will be down here in front, and we'll, we'll have a time of prayer. We'll also be available if you would like someone to pray with you personally. So just invite you to that time. Thank you. Now we can go. <laughs>